Greetings, podcast powerhouses. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And right now, that means the premiere episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Every week, we analyze the newest chapter of the MCU from multiple angles you will only find on this podcast. Our story cast explores the narrative themes of the episode and connects it to the wider world of literature and film. Our character cast examines the fates, choices, and futures of our favorite characters in great detail. And this is PonderVision. This show sits at the border of episodes past and future, asking the biggest, weirdest, and most challenging questions that keep us up at night about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and as always, I'm joined by the man who could sue the pants off whoever designed that god-awful knockoff Captain America outfit, Jesse Taylor. Hey, Jesse. Hey, I am glad to be a part of the fashion police now. I'm just saying there's got to be some kind of law, right? Help me out here. You're a lawyer. Can't we sue them Uh, over that design somehow? The ears alone are an outrage. Just misuse of government funds. Oh, yeah. I love it. You're always you're good at the financial crimes. I feel like you're always looking for the financial angle. It's one thing I've learned over my life, like as a lawyer, that you get people on financial stuff a lot more than you do on the violent stuff sometimes. That makes sense. Follow the money. That's what they say on like crime shows and whatnot, right? Right. Okay. And, you know, by the way, so much for a worry about a lack of podcast content coming from Falcon and the Winter Soldier, right? There's a ton to unpack here. Oh, man. I was I was surprised. I think we talked about this off the pod and we talked about it a little on the pod as well. But we were both worried that this would be a very straightforward action show mm-hmm. where you just show up. It'd be straightforward buddy comedy because that's kind of how it was built in the trailers. Totally. And, you know, the first episode would be them maybe fighting a low-level bad guy. They'd find out about the main bad guy. And then it'd be five episodes of Chase (laughs) with a resolution. And that's not what this is. Although, to be fair, that action was incredible. I talked about that a little bit with Christine. But that sequence to open it up with uh, Canyon Chase was, I think, among Marvel's best. I think so, too. And... Especially in a sense of you actually got some spatial orientation. There's always a worry when you're doing these big flying scenes and you've got multiple helicopters and people going from high to low and everything else that you won't know where anything is. And you followed it. It was very well done. Yeah, I loved it. Well, look, I'm excited to try some new structure for our podcast. We're going to talk about our biggest question, our weirdest question, our most meta question, our tinfoil hat question, and then we're going to end on our most uncomfortable questions for each other. So, Jesse, with that, have you got a really big, maybe the biggest question for me? I always have the biggest question for you. Yeah, buddy. We have a new, I guess this guy's Captain America. Uh, I guess. Like, I don't know. Have you seen the, um, the PS4 Avengers game? I've seen it. I haven't played it. Okay. So one of the big knocks on it when it came out is that it looked like somebody had recast the Avengers movie with like Cinemax level C-list actors. Yeah, no, I've seen the stills and the cutscenes and stuff, and it's just unsettling. They're close to the movie versions with right. the facial hair and the haircuts and whatnot, but just they seem off. You're right. Like the Dime Store version is right. Yeah, yeah because you can't you don't want to have to pay Chris Evans for his likeness. Mm-mm. So you need to change just enough. That it's like Melvin Evans, and that's oh, no. not what I want from my game. Evans. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it hurts because it's it's not a. There's no improvements in that look, and this guy especially. Christine really focused on his his weird thin lips. The jaw is funky. Look, the guy, the actor Wyatt Russell is a perfectly good looking dude in regular life, but they went out of their way to make him uncomfortably uncanny. Yeah, and I mean to. To invoke another show, it kind of reminded me of Homelander on The Boys. Oh, yeah. The actor who plays Homelander in real life, his name escapes me right now. But if you look at him in real life, handsome guy. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you look at like, that's a movie star. But you look for some reason, him as Homelander. Like, I hate that man's weird face. I hate his weird jaw. I hate his weird (laughs) mouth. I hate the things he does with his face. Everything about it. It's true. And that's what makes him a good character and a good actor. But... You've got this new Captain America. And in the comics, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we're used to the idea that people take over the mantles of 
heroes, that the identity goes beyond the hero. Mm -hmm. And in the MCU, we've never seen that. We've never had one hero take over another hero's mantle. You can sort of argue in Endgame that Captain America did that when he took Thor's hammer, but Thor was still there. Yeah, totally. Yeah, just he definitely he wasn't was... like, I'm the new god of thunder. Exactly. He was just like, you have an axe thingy. I've got this hammer now. It's cool. We'll work together. Right. And in the comics, Steve Rogers' identity is secret. In the real world, he's got a literal museum exhibit set up that just puts everybody knows everything about him. It's true. They knew even knew that he was in love with Peggy Carter, I'm assuming, from that <laughs> exhibit, which, ugh. <laughs> You're not a fan of being that exposed? <laughs> Uh, not really. And uh, <laughs> do you think they have an exhibit saying, did they fuck? Like, and right. then there's just like a way you could go into an interactive exhibit and, and enter your thoughts about whether or not uh, Steve and Peggy <laughs> consummated. <laughs> then if you pay $15 extra, like Steve fucked her great niece <laughs> oh, no, and then man. went back in time. Oh, God, it's so uncomfortable. Uh, so uncomfortable. Well, anyway, just, I'm sorry. I feel like okay. I keep derailing you here. I know. Um, but to get to the question. We now have, for the first time in the MCU, a new person having taken over the mantle of an iconic hero mm -hmm. and an iconic hero that, to the world's knowledge, is dead. And so how does the world take this? We had this like unexplained press conference. We don't really know who this guy is announcing the new Captain America. There's a small crowd there that's cheering for him. But how would it strike the public that the government had just basically taken the shield and sort of the costume and the name and identity from Steve Rogers and just given it to someone else for, I don't know, reasons. There just needed to be a Captain America. You know, the first thing this makes me think of is how little time people actually spent with Steve Rogers as Captain America in this universe. Because it was like a couple years in the 40s and then he's gone for forever and then he's back from what, 2010 to 2023? Right. If I recall correctly. In five of those years, half the people are gone and the rest of them didn't care because he was just having small support groups. Like there was no superheroing being done. So let's call it eight years of active duty in the modern era. And most people didn't really get to spend a lot of time with Steve. And he didn't seem like he was a huge fan of like deep dive media profiles and whatnot. So I think he might be easier to replace than you'd think. Maybe not you specifically, but then most people would think. that That's kind of my first reaction. What do you think about that? So I, I kind of get that. Uh, but then I also think about Coulson having the Captain America trading cards. Good the point. fact that Captain America was enough of an icon to have a museum exhibit set up to him that was set up before he came back. Oh, right. Because he went and got his old gear from there in Winter Soldier. And right. Whatnot, right. And so when you think about that, he was a fixture and that was tied to him being Steve Rogers. And so is the public going to be okay with separating the two out? And how do you sell this new Captain America to the public, especially when he doesn't have that 98 pound weakling backstory, at least as far as we know? No, you're actually making me rethink that because... They would clearly lionized him in the time that he was gone, which is why his return was so meaningful. You're right. They had exhibits to him. It was much easier to put him on a pedestal because he was gone. And people didn't replace him in the 40s or 50s, which might make it especially strange to people to replace him now. I can say that Twitter will immediately hate this dude, right? The second he shows up, yeah. everything we're talking about, Twitter's going to have a field day. I feel like Fox News would love him. I think it comes down to part of whether or not he has abilities. Do you think this guy is going to be juiced or not? I'm assuming so, because I don't really see the point of dressing up a normal guy or a normal soldier, even if he's in great shape, etc., and sending him out into the field as Captain America, unless, and we might see this, he's a different kind of Captain America than Steve Rogers. You know, Steve Rogers had a gun in World War II. True. But in his modern incarnation was just a superpowered guy with a shield that defied the laws of physics and he could make it through pretty much any situation. He could, you know, go toe to toe with Thanos even after even though he lost. But like, he's a guy who could stand up to him for a minute or two. Whereas if it's just a guy with Captain America's shield, is that <laughs> quite the same thing? 
I think there's definitely a chance. We saw in the trailers, right? This guy runs out on a football field and high fives a marching band person or something, mm -hmm. right? There's definitely a chance that John Walker runs out on a field, is doing a big Super Bowl halftime performance, and is immediately assassinated by the Flag Smashers. I yeah. think he could absolutely just be killed next episode right away. That's one way this could go, which would... I think answer this question in the negative. People would right. not feel good about this replacement getting capped by a bunch of masked weirdos right away. So, but I think he might be juiced as well. We know the Flag Smashers have some juiced people. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you some questions about that when we get a little bit farther into the episode. What would you, Jesse Taylor, Department of Defense employee, you're not, I mean, but if you were, yeah. just so folks know, Jesse is not a Department of Defense employee. I do speak for the government, but in a different capacity. Um, what would you recommend that they do to have this guy win people over? Like, let's say it's a good faith effort. It's mm -hmm. not, but if it was, what would you do? I mean, you kind of have to use them like they used Cap initially in World War II, where if you remember from the first Avenger, he doesn't see the battlefield for months and months, maybe a year. I can't remember exactly how long it is. But yeah, you send him around and you basically have him be the like a sort of rah rah he's he's going to be a mall captain america basically he shows right. up in public places people are happy to see him they get to take their picture with him he gives whatever spiel they're trying to sell in the post blip era <laughs> and then he goes away and maybe he does he does the you know the today show junket and he maybe does some psas he, he might do the same psas that they had in spider-man Right, right, right. It's a little, uh, little sex ed class by, by new Captain America. Exactly. But I think that's what you have to do. You just have to turn him into a celebrity and move him away from being a superhero. That makes sense. Captain America as influencer would work. I think that's a really good idea. I was figuring he'd go in and do some kind of semi-staged intervention somewhere. They said he was here to defend America. So I'm assuming he's going to do stuff on this continent. And the worst idea I can think of is that they involve him in border patrol which would not surprise me if that came up it was a huge component of sam's stories in the comics when he became captain america feels like it might be a little complicated to bring into the six episodes arc we have here but that would be the worst choice i think if they involve him in immigration patrol that would just be a nightmare yeah. and you brought up something earlier that's interesting does he turn into kind of a fox news talking head Ugh. Yeah, do like Janine Pirro's, like, you know, like that falls in the next slot or whatever. Ugh. He takes over whenever one of them has to go on vacation because they hired another Nazi. Ugh. Yeah, he has the ears for it. I don't know. It's just something so unsettling about those being exposed in that helmet. I can't. They're really. Oh, I can't get over it. Well, I would like to take this in a slightly different direction, though similar, I think, for my biggest question I can't get rid of after thinking about this episode for several days. People seem to agree that. Sam giving up this shield was a mistake, quote unquote. And we talk about that handing over the disc in our character cast as a really tough choice that Sam makes. But at the same time, we also talked about how difficult the choice would have been for him to step forward and assume that mantle. Rhodey seems to make it seem like a really easy choice or at least something that would have been a straightforward op option for him. My question to you, Jesse, is what do you think would have happened if Sam had chosen to name himself Captain America in the wake of Endgame? Well, one thing we don't know yet. We, do we know the official story about what happened to Captain America? What does the public know about Captain America? So based on the weird but adorable tribute from Far From Home, they seem to assume he's dead. But then there are, as Torres says, a bunch of conspiracy theories that he's on the moon, which could be true. We know that Nick Fury's out there somewhere and maybe old man Steve's out there too. Definitely a possibility, but it doesn't seem like anyone has any answers to that question, right? Right. And so let's say the official story is that he's dead. I thought it was interesting to have Rhodey be the one to talk to Sam about it. One, because they're the two most prominent black superheroes mm -hmm. at this point. And also, as far as we know, Rhodey hasn't taken over as Iron Man. True which is kind of an interesting thing where Sam taking over as Captain America would be sort of seen as the normal path of things. But for whatever reason, Rhodey taking over as Iron Man wouldn't. And maybe that's because Tony Stark was the one who snapped his fingers and he has a different role in society. Maybe it's because he's already war machine, a very similar kind of hero. But suppose Sam had chosen to name himself Captain America. 
I think the first question is going to be, did Sam do something to Captain America? Um, if there's already conspiracy theories going around about what happened, I could see that being a part of them. That Sam somehow took Captain America out of commission, especially if he's affiliated with the Winter Soldier. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't really know what people know about the Winter Soldier right now. But if he's going to be affiliated with and working with the Winter Soldier, this is a guy who tried to kill Captain America, who killed the King of Wakanda, who by all reckonings is kind of a public enemy, number one, who may just be being, I'm not sure what's going on, but being uh, rehabilitated by the U.S. government or being protected by the U.S. government, very unclear on that front. And I'm sure we'll find out more as these episodes go on. But I think the immediate response would have been almost not take him seriously like mm -hmm. there's one captain america he died you don't just get to pick up the costume and carry on with him which also makes me interested to see how the new captain america is treated by the public at large there's also the element of captain america it seems like the government has sort of treated the identity as something it has the power to hand out so also if sam does this does the government just step in and say no captain america looks like this this goofy Oof. guy with the big ears, not like you. Um, and by goofy guy with the big ears, I mean white. Um, <laughs> and so he looks like this. He acts like this. You, Sam Wilson, are not that. Thank you for your service. Go fly around Tunisia for a little bit and save this guy. Yeah. The government intervention part, I think, is probably right. Christine, we touched on this in Character Cast. She pointed out that there would be a million op-eds all about this on all sides. So Sam would become a, a topic of debate and a tool for people to advance agendas on whatever side of the political spectrum they wanted. I think the government would either outright draft him into service in some sort of way or pass some kind of clear law that they control this identity. The shield is technically still government property, and they certainly talk that way to Sam when he gives it back. Mm hmm. And I, so I think that alone would be a piece they would immediately try to leverage. They'd immediately try to take that shield back once it became public, because it's clear it hasn't been out in public in the few months since Endgame. And so, yeah, I think the government would immediately involve themselves and overcomplicate themselves. And a lot of it comes down to what kind of administration is in office. If it's a Trump style administration, they'll do everything they can to turn him into a puppet or a pawn, take it from him and give it to someone who will be a good soldier and if it's even if it's a progressive administration or a democratic administration, I could easily see them overthinking this and doing something incredibly stupid. It feels like something the government has been waiting 80 years for is to be able to name another Captain America on their own terms. This Captain America started defying orders in the middle of World War II and became too popular to do anything about. Right. I don't think that the government likes a loose cannon on the payroll or not on the payroll. They want him on the payroll so they can control him. Yeah. And... Yeah, so I think the government would try to shut it down and it would have been a pretty miserable experience that would have ended in Sam being tokenized on all sides. That's kind of how I feel like it would have gone. And also from the government's perspective, thinking about the entire Captain America arc, he was a government experiment who went rogue in the 40s, got frozen, came back, fought with the Avengers, then revealed that a high-level government agency and a high-level government official were all secret neo-Nazis who'd infiltrated the government, <laughs> then defied the government, went on the run, <laughs> helped an assassin who was also his hundred and some odd year old best friend. <laughs> so I can also see exactly what you're saying, that the government wants that control. If Captain America is going to continue to exist, it's going to continue to exist as a guy that they know is under their thumb who will hopefully do what they want. Um, and if he goes outside the bounds, it's going to be in the interest of advancing the government's interests rather than advancing his own interests or his friend's interests. If Sony fights this hard for Spider-Man, just think of how hard the U.S. government would fight for Captain America <laughs> as a real person. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Well, let's get weird with it now. Jesse... Shock me with something strange. What's the weirdest question on your mind? Do you remember the part where Sam's nephews went to go play video games? I do. Is a PS5 <laughs> still going to be as difficult to get in 2023 when half the world's population returns? A PS5. Okay. This is a great category. This definitely fits weirdest question. 
I actually think I have an answer for you, which is it would be even harder to get. Think about this. Factories have been dormant for years. We might actually be ahead of them on mass production of consumer devices compared to because they're still stuck in 2018 or 19 tech. And again, it's all all become outdated and, you know, it's left to decay. They haven't had any kind of production cycles for several years that could match any kind of the demand that is out there. So when half the world's kids return, there is no inventory for them, no infrastructure to make that inventory. And on top of that, think of how many things are ahead of the consumer electronics world in terms of priorities for mass production. You're going to need Every all kinds of food stuffs and the tech you are going to need to build is going to be things that helps people create a life. So I actually think a PS5 is completely off the table in 2023. It's still they're just starting to design it because the no one would have bought it in the in the space between the snap and the blip. No one would have been able to make it. And now they just can't even put the infrastructure together, Jesse. That's where I'm at. Wow. So 2023. Sam's nephews are playing some brand new PS4 games. If they're lucky, yeah. That's the best case scenario in my opinion. I think that's right. And you know, I mean, Wanda was driving a 2019 Buick Verano. Was it 2019? It was. It was specifically (gasps) a 2019 cherry red Buick Verano. I didn't notice that it was actually as old as it was supposed to be. That See, that... So, yes, that 100% (laughs) PS4 confirmed. (laughs) no... (laughs) There is no PS5, and if anyone offers it to you, they are definitely Mephisto. That's a great question. I want to spend some time on my weirdest question, Jesse, which is, what do you think Bucky's Tinder dating profile was like? I know exactly what it's like. Oh, God. So, uh, his username is whatever default (laughs) username they gave him. Oh, no. Oh, no. B Barnes 37269 or whatever. Exactly. His password is just password one exclamation point, if that's even the security they have on the website. Oh, man. I don't know if there's a picture. There's probably a picture. It's probably like either an old scan of something or he had uh, one of his friends from the neighborhood just take a picture of him because he still doesn't really get (laughs) selfies. It's as straightforward as you get. All of his answers are from the 30s and 40s. Because it's the last time he remembers being a human being. Are they short or long answers? Is he like a one word guy or is he writing whole sentences because it's old timey? Oh, that's a good question. I'm going to say they're full sentences, but they're weird and slightly off. (laughs) Yeah, that tracks. Because probably the phrasing of the questions, like I don't, I have not been on a dating website in years, but I'm assuming the questions are going to be phrased in such a way that it's going to seem weird to him. Like they're going to be hipper and maybe slangier than he's used to. So he won't know what some of the words means. He probably responds to some things pretty literally that aren't meant to be taken literally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And I will guarantee you that he has like 57 unread messages, but doesn't know how to get to them. (laughs) Did you know what the tiger picture thing was all about when they referenced that? No. So Christine did, and I read some articles about it between StoryCast and CharacterCast, so I caught up. Apparently, it was a really common thing in the mid-2010s for people to literally pose with tigers, like pictures of them with tigers. And there was a whole campaign to educate people on why this is animal abuse and you should not find somebody you can hire to let you take a picture with a tiger because that tiger is being mistreated. So it was apparently a really huge and common thing. But Apparently, it was way, way, way more common for men to do it because obviously men are much more terrible in general and would do incredibly thoughtless things like this and think that that somehow made them look cool. So the question is whether Bucky might be bi. Why not? Yeah, I think it'd be great. I'm open and I I hope that they, you know, first of all, Bucky wants to call me. I think Amanda would be over the moon with with that (laughs) result. Um, So, you know, we, we can talk is all I'm saying. I just feel like if you're 106 years old, you have a bionic arm and you're a recovering assassin, like explore. I was trying to think about the worst dating profile Bucky could have. And I was thinking about him shirtless with the metal arm, like holding a puppy in the metal hand, you know, with like the sunset behind him. 
I thought that would be a pretty terrifying. Oh, uh, I've got I've got one that would be just as bad, which I know about this from various BuzzFeed articles, but just him kneeling with like 15 Wakandan kids surrounding him. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh my god, that's a horrifying thought. And he's in like a toga style outfit and this so yeah, all kind of weird Jesus y vibes. Exactly. And then like he's just a very lighthearted, like from my somewhere abroad in Africa. Oh no. Um yeah, the most wanted man in the world could be his tag, right? Because he was for a while the most wanted man in the world. Right. That would be a thing. If I was actually going to suggest Bucky make a good dating profile. I think he should use pictures of himself from the 40s because I think that would look super cool. And I think there are enough people who are into weird subcultures that I think he could actually find someone who was just really into 40s shit. So he doesn't have to say I'm from the 40s. Mm -hmm. But if he just presents as I'm your mid-century beau, he uses the slang from the 40s. He's in the outfits from the 40s and he just goes for it. He'll find someone who thinks that is the hottest and coolest thing in the entire world Instead of people who think that his flowers are weird and silly. Completely. Yeah. Bucky, we're here for you. We actually don't know a lot about online dating and haven't written a profile in incredibly long amounts of time, but you can count on me and Jesse. Yes. And if you're bi, we're into it. Yeah. Let's talk. Let's just, hey, let's just get coffee and see where it, where it goes, <laughs> man. <laughs> on that note, I'd like to step out of the text a little and get into the meta questions, Jesse. Do you have anything meta for me? I do. I was reading an article this week about Ed Brubaker. He's the writer who invented the Winter Soldier. Um, and invented in comics is always a hard word to use um, because it's one, usually a, a sort of invention by committee. And also the Winter Soldier is based off of Bucky, a, cap, a character that was created in the... Was Captain America created in what, 41? Like the 41. actual comic book? December character? 40, I think, technically. Okay. But invented in 1940 along with Bucky. And so Brubaker didn't invent Bucky, but did invent the concept of the Winter Soldier. Bucky having come back just like Captain America did, the brainwashing, everything. And he doesn't get royalties off of the Winter Soldier. He doesn't get a lot of credit for the Winter Soldier. And I'm not even sure. Ne- I didn't watch the credits all the way through to see if he gets credit in this episode or if he's gotten credit in prior movies for having invented the character. But when we think about how the comics industry is notoriously bad at giving credit, at giving compensation, at treating the creators of these characters as lasting parts of the characters' identities, other than Stan Lee, pretty much. You know, you have sort of your big, your Stan Lee, your Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko for Spider-Man, um, and some others for some of the big characters whose creators are iconically linked with them. But we have so many characters created by so many people that have become world-spanningly popular, or even if they're not themselves popular, incredibly critical to kind of the dominant entertainment content in the world right now. How do we feel about enjoying these characters, enjoying these narratives, knowing that the creators are kind of getting screwed in the process? There's a lot there. I have two levels of thought on that. The first is about Brubaker himself, right? He's an interesting guy. I know he was a Navy kid growing up. Apparently, he spent a lot of time at Guantanamo growing up before it became a human rights hellscape, just a regular old Navy base. But he had this idea of the Winter Soldier essentially as a kid, I think, about Bucky and what to do with him and really had this built up inside him. But he was not a hardcore superhero guy. He was a crime comics writer who Marvel brought in for a while to tell what I think is mostly considered the best Steve Rogers stories of all time. And certainly the creation of the Winter Soldier is one of the most original aspects of the Cap larger mythology that we've ever seen. But he seems to have left all of the Marvel stuff behind and not with any bad blood. He's just off doing his own original projects again. He came in, he did the cap thing, he left. He's had multiple new projects come out over the last two years and hasn't really ever seemed to try to use the Marvel stuff to promote his work or anything. So I could be misreading it, but I actually feel like he's doing fine in terms of where he's at. It would be much better if he was getting compensated, obviously. But, But I think Brubaker has made his peace with how he used Marvel and Marvel used him, and they're both making do with that. 
But most creators are not in that place where Ed Brubaker is, right? Whether they're, they created something of value 40 or 50 years ago or created something more recently. And it's the dirty secret of the whole comics world that they've gotten better over time about figuring out how to screw creators out of all of their money. And even worse, a lot of these creators are barely able to make ends meet while they're writing the work. Right. So on top of them not getting the royalties for the movies or whatever, it's such a competitive field and comics have been such an up and down industry that artists especially can still struggle to pay the rent on the comics alone when they're doing high profile titles like Batman or Captain America or whatever. So it feels like it should be illegal. And you can tell me that there, there it, there's no question that it is not illegal now for the Marvel to, to, to take total creative control of everything that happens under their roof. But it feels like that should change. You know, musicians who write a song can always claim credit for that song, even if it's, you know, work, you know, they're part of a label deal or whatever. And I feel like comics creators and artists deserve some of that same protection. They do. The hard part is just you're fighting tradition in an industry that has always behaved like this. True. Your hope when you create, and this is just my understanding. I, I don't have a ton of direct involvement with this, but your hope when you create, say, a Wolverine is not just that Wolverine is a popular comics character and you get to keep writing him for 10 or 15 years and you get paid to write Wolverine. Your hope is that Wolverine ends up on T-shirts and in TV shows and you'll see a kid going to school one day who has on a Wolverine backpack or something like that. And that's right. happened with, very pop with certain popular characters. And in terms of providing that credit, those royalties, everything like that. I think in all honesty, it, it comes down to unionization. It comes down to mm -hmm. having some sort of effective labor protections. And a lot of people in the entertainment field are part of unions that protect those rights that they have agents who help them negotiate. And when you're talking about a comic book writer who, even when you hit the big time, you're not raking in millions of dollars a year it's, it's a harder industry precisely because the margins are so much smaller. And as you were saying, it's so competitive that, you know, you think about Marvel, what would happen if writers tried to unionize? They'd fire everybody and bring in a bunch of scrubs. Exactly. And they would still sell probably just as many comics, maybe a few less because the big names would be gone. But other than that, they would just bust whatever union labor organizing process was in place and move on to the next group of people. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's kind of a grim prospect. If I can offer a ray of hope, though. Please do. That is basically why Image Comics exists, right? Mm -hmm. The premise of Image is that all the creators own their works. They own the movie rights to their works. They own all of that stuff. So I'm hopeful that Image presents a, a really powerful model for people to use if and when they can organize. And as we exhaust the Marvel and DC universe Image has some of the most original stories left to tell. And when superheroes continue to evolve and we look for these more and more challenging and original and postmodern and complicated stories about powers or meta westerns with space lasers in, in, in alternate dimensions and whatnot, Image has a huge library of all of that stuff that will really wow people. So you don't get the same nostalgia effect for generations like Gen X to pull in all these Marvel characters and whatnot. But I'm hopeful that image uh, is the way forward for people, and maybe we can get Marvel and DC to catch up a little bit. I mean, you'd hope, I th but I think Marvel Image was founded in, I think, 93. Yeah. And still kind of the same, yeah. Yeah, man. Marvel, you talk a big game progressively, but you got to take care of your creators, man. And they've been terrible about it for so long. Like, Jack Kirby did a lot of work that Stanley took credit for over the decades. Stanley's not yeah. a bad dude. I'm not here to demonize the guy. But damn, you know, right. And a lot of creators got erased along the way. There's people who had some great ideas and you don't know their names anymore because they got swept up by either the big names at Marvel or it just became part of the mill. Speaking of doing better, Malcolm Spellman challenged the audience a lot more than I expected when it came to questions of systemic racism in this show. But I was incredibly surprised and I don't know why, Jesse, maybe I shouldn't have been that there was a huge army of people out there on the internet 
who were shocked to hear the idea that the banking scene had anything to do with race. Or were making the argument that, of course, the government has every right to their property. They created that shield. And the idea that these were aspects of systemic racism were you know, supposedly very surprising to them. And these were on forums that I generally don't think of as incredibly out of whack or super conservative. So it was just very alarming. In fact, even one of the podcasts I listened to, Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast by Stranded Panda, these dudes are pretty openly progressive, but they were struggling to wrap their minds around whether or not the banking scene had anything to do with structural racism, at least one of the hosts. The other host did a better job of kind of catching the other guy up. But I don't know, man. I guess my meta question was, was this episode too subtle about the role of systemic racism in the story? I don't think so. And the reason for it is that it felt as genuine as anything I've seen in an MCU show about a person's everyday life. Mm -hmm. So Sam and Sarah go to the bank and there's a few things at play here. The first is that Sam is successful and Sam is coming back home and Sam is doing what any number of successful black people do when they get successful, which is they come home to take care of their families. It's something that's happened in my life. It's something that happened in the life of a lot of the successful black people that I work with, um, where you become the person who has the good job or you get the raise and your family needs something. And this is not, you know, somebody leeching on or begging or anything like that. It's literally you have family that doesn't have the resources that you have. Because thanks to systemic racism, they haven't built up the wealth and resources that other families um, who are white might have. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing you want to do is help. And Sam does exactly what I think any number of black people in this country have done for decades in the past. They have a job. They have resources. He has. He is probably one of the most famous people in the world um, at this point, like. I don't know if he's, you know, a LeBron James style style, style famous, but definitely the guy just looks at him and he's like, I know exact I know who you are, but I can't place you. And he goes about this in the way that I think most people would. He says, We're gonna go to this bank. We have a great idea. This is something that we should get money for. And is shot down at the same time the guy is literally asking him for something. And what I liked about it was the excuse that was given is the same kind of excuse that you heard throughout years past when black people were denied mortgages, denied loans, denied even checking accounts, which is there's some external issue that just makes us unable to take the risk on you. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I love the fact that they pointed out in the same scene, you don't have any work history for the past five years. And Sarah says, I haven't existed for five years. Right. How am I supposed to have work history? This is something that several months in, there should be some way of dealing with. It should be known. It, they may not have the entire system down pat, but there has to be a better answer than you were blipped. So we just can't give you any money until you have five years of work experience that you can't get because you were blipped. Right. Whereas if you just know the right people, somehow you'll probably be fine. Right. For what it's worth, I think the fact that all these people were having to debate this is proof that this did exactly what I bet Malcolm Spellman hoped, which is it forced a lot of white people to reckon with the fact that racism doesn't always just frog march in the frickin' streets, you know? Yeah, I just think that the, the fact that everyone has to argue about it and it's forcing these really awkward conversations between white guys on podcasts where they supposedly try to make it about escapism and not politics, fucking jackpot as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and I just want to give Spellman praise and everybody on that show praise for basically the entire scene for when Sam steps foot on the boat through the bank is just so, it felt so authentic in a way that the premise shouldn't. That Like, what do you mean? Like a flying superhero who just rescued an army captain on the border of Libya, the fact that he comes back from that sort of that escapism, that unrealistic, 
fantasy style plot to this real world situation and watching him and his sister put those plates together in the kitchen Mm -hmm. uh watching him with family with friends it just felt authentic and natural in a way that mcu stuff often doesn't because it doesn't have the room to be it doesn't have the room to breathe yeah i'm really excited once again by what this is telling us and i know i teased you with the possibility earlier of talking about this cycle of marvel reluctant fandom that people have right where they they enjoy something, but then it ends and it's maybe not perfect. Like the WandaVision finale did have a CGI battle that people who really enjoyed a lot of the weirder stuff didn't like. And then they were like, ah, and now we're going back to this smash them up action thing. And is this going to be the thing that kills the MCU? And then they watch it and it's really good. And then they get back on board and okay, one more thing. I feel like the critic class is generally in this boat. But again, I think they're showing that this might be the space where you can challenge the most people because it is the monoculture. And if Marvel can keep growing, we talked about this last time, they're not there yet, but if they can keep making progress, I like their odds to have some impact on the culture in a good way. Yeah. We'll see, man. All right, it's time to take off our producer hats and put on our tinfoil hats, Jesse. What's your tinfoil hat question for me? Is the new Captain America Mephisto? Now... I was kidding when I ended StoryCast with that. I, I want to be clear. I, I don't, if, you know, you don't actually think he's Mephisto, right? No. You're just messing with me on my quest and categories. Yeah, I'm just, I'm pretty sure he's just like some random Marine that they picked out because he'd do exactly what they said. Uh, but I do miss that theorizing from WandaVision just a little bit. <laughs> God damn it. Well, I'm going to make you answer a real question about him. What do you think his role is going to be in the story? Because he's an outsider to the Avengers universe, like he's got the shield and he's got the mantle of Captain America, but he's otherwise completely unknown. I do think that he ends up in some sort of combat situation that he is utterly unprepared to be in. <laughs> oh, God. And I, I, I'm not sure exactly what happens, but... The fact that it's six episodes and we already have a group of Flag Smashers plus the superpower Flag Smasher that we saw we sure um, from the one scene, which means that I just can't see us having a six episode series, which feels this episode felt like it went by in a snap. No mm. pun intended, mm. but it felt like it took no time at all. We were just at the end and I was like, wait, wait why isn't there more? So I don't feel as if there's going to be multiple adversaries in that sense. Like, I don't feel like he's going to be a, a, an A-level antagonist. I could see him being more of a psychological antagonist. Like, it actually wouldn't surprise me if he just ends up being racist. Right. And that's how he's the antagonist. He doesn't fight anybody, but he's just, you know, he goes to Sam and he says, like, you couldn't handle it because you're a black person. People like you can't handle responsibility like this. And that's how he becomes an evil person. That's how he is the antagonist in the show. I don't think he survives the show as a character. I think after this, we'll probably be done with the Captain America, the fake Captain America storyline. Captain America? Wait, no, that's that's yeah. terrible. Uh, but, you know, there is the U.S. agent character from the comics. So does he stick around after that? as U.S. agent and kind of become a thorn in new Captain America side. I'm still rooting for him to become a smoking crater in the middle of the next episode, thanks to the Flag Smashers. But I do like the idea that he becomes U.S. agent and is this thorn in the side of the of future Avengers as he's a, a government agent, but maybe fucking shit up instead of helping them do their jobs. And if he's like a racist, that will be an especially complicated problem for them all to deal with. But there's a lot of racism in the U.S. military. So, you know, wouldn't shock me. Right. The interesting thing, though, is you can see how it would be executed in this show. But then what happens if you start putting Sam as Captain America back into the full Avengers fold? And they're, you know, the next set of characters and narratives we have coming up is going to involve the Eternals. It's going to be probably more space focused uh, than this previous phase of stories where it's like, you know, where does just a racist 
guy fit into those stories. I don't know, Jesse. It sounds like you're telling me working class white guys can't get a break anymore. And we need to do more for these guys. That's what it sounds like you're telling me. I mean, I'm very woke. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Won't somebody look out for the white guy? Oh, um, I have a, an actual tinfoil hat question for you because I took this category seriously, unlike some podcast co-hosts I know. It was sprung on me at the last minute. Oh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Where did the Flag Smashers super soldier dude come from, Jesse? This dude was able to kick Torres or someone. He kicked someone into a flagpole. I don't remember if that was Torres, but he certainly was super strong, did a bunch of super strong shit. It was terrifying. How does he have these powers? Well, one thing we know is that Various governments around the world and the American government in particular have been trying to recreate the super soldier serum Mm -hmm. since Captain America was created because it was destroyed. Somebody could have succeeded. And that might be the most straightforward explanation. At some time in the prior five years, somebody figured out how to create a super soldier serum. This is the guy who got injected with it, or this is the person who got injected with it. We don't know yet. Gender. Uh, But... That, to me, seems the most straightforward answer. Uh, We also don't know the person could have some sort of enhancements um, cybernetically. We know that the Winter Soldier program existed, so that's another way that a person could have superpowers but still appear to be a regular person. That's closer to where I land. I think it's going to wind up being part of what happened to the super soldier serum they stole from Howard Stark when Winter Soldier assassinated him in 1991. Because we know that is what led to the Winter Soldier program and and infused those other people. But I have a feeling that they didn't use it all up. And it could even be the case that Helmut Zemo is the one who found the rest of that when he was hanging out at that base. And maybe he's helping these Flag Smashers out and got one of them a little juiced up. That would make sense. See, tinfoil hats. You can still put them on even though we're not in one division. I think it's possible. That's all I'm saying. We just can't dedicate a whole podcast to it. And uh, I'll be excited to get Jess and Owen back into a show when we can get weird with it. But, Jesse, it's time for our most uncomfortable questions. What do you have? So I'm taking the bank scene, and I am spreading it out to all of society. This is something we talked a lot about in WandaVision, but it was more a question about how life in the MCU worked. Do blipped people come back as second-class citizens? Because if you think about how our lives run today, we are dominated in so many ways by our verifiable history, by the fact that we have a credit score, that we have financial records, that somebody can look back and see how long we've paid our rent, or our mortgage, um, our criminal history, et cetera. When blipped people come back and they have five years where nothing happened, do they effectively become second-class citizens, people who can't get the opportunities that would otherwise be available to them because they just weren't in the world to have those opportunities. That's a grim thought that blip people would be last on the list for everything. Because think of the hiring manager excuses that would be out there. Well, you're not up to speed on the new technology, right? Right. I mean, I was just saying, I don't know how much new stuff has been produced, but that's the kind of excuse I feel like you would hear. Or we'd love to hire you, but your uncertain housing situation, or you have too many priorities outside of work, given all the chaos in your life. You know, I could see so many hiring managers dodging these people who disappeared. Right. And, you know, I, I, the more I think about it, the better an intro of Spider-Man was into the post blip world, because as high school students, there's not, those issues aren't at play nearly as much. Right. If you're 16 years old and you come back, you still got to complete the next year, two years, three years of high school. Nobody's going to look at you and say like, oh, well, sorry, you, you can't get a diploma because you were gone for five years. It's just get back in class, you know. Yeah. The worst case scenario is what Betty Brant said happened to them, which is they had completed midterms for a semester or for a year of school, but had to go all the way back to the beginning, which compared to what we're talking about for blipped people in the employment world is relatively no big deal. Exactly. And one of the things I think about is as a lawyer. Oh my God, you would have had all your shit expire. Right. Like you probably wouldn't be barred anymore. Would you have to take the bar exam again? Oh no. You wouldn't know anything that happened in the last five years. And as we've talked about a lot, the law is going to be very weird in a post blip world. Like, can you imagine coming back as a divorce attorney or an estate attorney <laughs> in a post-blip world. And it's like, 
I was great beforehand. Now there's 1,500 laws on the books about how to handle all of the stuff. The new issues of blip people coming back, and I have no idea what's going on. And you're dealing with your own shit if you were blipped, right? Just like right. we were talking about. Like you have so many things. I feel like we'd need like a WPA New Deal style approach just to handle basic employment on top of things like the infrastructure, which was crumbling based on the wide shots we got of cities and stuff in Endgame. Think of what we're going to need for food production, for all of these things that will bring the world back to some kind of stable place. And maybe that's the solution. We, we create a WPA program to bring all of these things back up to speed while putting everyone back to work and putting work histories in place. And on top of that, though, they need so much better business loan tools than they clearly have available to them. Mm. Um, yeah, that actually, I mean, that just made me think of another thing. Like, when the blip people come back, it's going to be like the start of the pandemic where store shelves are bare. Oh, yeah, you're right. You have, even if there's no run on anything, you're just going out to get your normal groceries. But for twice as many people, there yeah. won't be enough food. Or toilet paper, which we saw at the beginning of the pandemic is the first thing everyone runs for, apparently. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, my daughter, one weekend, she wanted to uh, wrap herself up like a mummy. And it was very cute. And it's a, it's a quintessential childhood thing. But I immediately went back to the start of the pandemic and was just like, can we afford half a roll of toilet <laughs> oh, paper? No, yeah, right. Yeah. And just that would be true for every single item. You're totally right. The yeah. runs on everything would be horrifying. Yeah. So I do think you're right. Blipped folks are getting screwed over in a million ways. Part of it is an accident. Part of it is inertia of the previous five years and the way everything had kind of lapsed. And then part of it is prejudice, whether it's it's against blipped people for them not being there. We saw the resentment that can crop up from people who had to struggle through those five years and the people who just get to, quote unquote, you know, come back. But yeah, it also then allows you to use that as an excuse to to advance other prejudices, subconscious or conscious, whether it's against poor folks, black folks, other people of color, it's yeah, it's going to be a disaster. Yeah. And I'd be fascinated to see how it shook out, because obviously when Thanos snapped, his only wish was that half of life disappeared. He wasn't trying. I don't believe there was any part of it where he was trying to have it impact any groups equally. Would have even known or cared about various divisions on various planets. So let's say the blip just happened to hit in America hit people of color harder than it did white people for whatever reason. Just the randomness of a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. You all of a sudden have a class of people coming back and I could see all those issues of racism and bigotry stemming up and basically feeding into the blip and the blip becomes the excuse for those other prejudices. Yeah, I think that's right. I figured Marvel was not going to spend any time at all wrestling with the questions the blip would provide other than maybe the occasional She-Hulk legal episode or something like that. I'm really impressed that they are trying to tackle some of this. Yeah. And I think at a certain point you have to like either you have to fast forward everything another five years so that although the big issues have been ironed out and maybe there's a few hiccups left over or else you've got to tackle it head on because otherwise it just becomes this lingering question in everything you do hmm. because yeah imagine you had the show and you know falcon just showed up and they got the loan and nothing else happened not only would that avoid the issue or kind of dodge the issue of racism that the show actually that the show brought up um head on but also just the entire issue of how does the world work now what goes on? How like, how do you do anything? And I, I think, again, this gets back to the issue you were talking about before with the kind of constant Marvel fan cycle of, okay, I like this, but are they going to screw it up? I like this, but are they going to screw it up? And I think after when people started to think about the blip, that's always been the worry that they're going to screw it up, that it's not going to make any sense, that it's just going to be this massive world changing thing that they'll gloss over to get onto you know, fighting the next bad guy. That's how comics often do it. Hydra right. takes over the country. And then two issues later, everyone's acting like, well, that was sure a weird year where, you know, Hydra had control of the country, but sure. Great to be back here doing my regular things. Like none of this happened. And, and they're not approaching it that way. I, I guess I had low expectations and I'm really pleased that they're exceeding them. 
Yeah. My uncomfortable question is, how much of this, and by this I mean the problems that Sam and Bucky are dealing with, and especially Sam, how much of this is Steve Rogers' fault for bailing on the fallout of what it means to be Captain America? You said earlier, we don't really know where Steve Rogers is, basically. And I think that's right. He didn't disappear with a plan. He just fucking disappeared. He hands Sam the shield. And what? Knowing that the world was going to be in total chaos when all these people came back, knowing that it was not going to be easy for Sam to step forward as a black man and say, I'm Captain America now. He put he just tossed all of that in Sam's lap and also left Bucky to just sort of deal with his shit. So how much of all the shit that's going on in this show is Steve Rogers fault? I'd say a significant amount. It was an odd character choice. It was the oddest beat of Endgame, I think. Hmm. It makes complete sense that they're going to be the he's going to be the one they trust to return all the Infinity Stones. He's not going to abuse the power. He's known by the people they're returning all of the stones to. And to the extent he's not known, he can get around in those environments. He can return it to the army base, things like that. And then to all of a sudden, in the middle of that, just be like, you know what? I'm just going to head back to the 40s, find the hot lady that I never got to go on the date with and that I've been pining after this entire time, and I'm just going to go be with her. And to just do that, to not warn anybody, to not tell anyone, for someone who kind of was the, who was the leader of the Avengers, who viewed himself as being the selfless protector of others, to do that and to put his two closest friends in that position, I mean, I, I just don't know what the rationale was and the fact that chris evans is coming back Hmm. we know that he's going to have some appearances as captain america even if he's not going to be um there may not be another chris evans as captain america movie i feel like they're going to have to wrestle with that at some point he's going to have to there might be a portion of the show where he explains why he did what he did or gives them some key to figure all this out but even if he's idealistic enough to think that sam can just take the shield and be captain america Bucky's life is fucked up beyond belief. (laughs) Just fucked up. (laughs) Right. Like, what does Bucky, even Captain America, when he came back, he came back as like a handsome, muscular man who immediately was pressed into service to save the world. Yeah. Like, S.H.I.E.L.D. was like, yeah, we want you back. Like, here's what you do. Um, He had America's ass. Exactly. And Bucky's got like an arm with a star on it. And just a lot of dead people in his wake. Yeah. And the fact that he just didn't seem to really process that or care, it just seems very on Captain America E. On Captain America ish, Captain America esque. I don't know what the. What's <laughs> All the of the above, Jesse. All of yeah. the above. My thing is, they spent a lot of time between Winter Soldier and Civil War building this arc where Steve Rogers became super wary of big government institutions becoming corrupted. So how could he not know that the mantle of Captain America was going to get caught up into this as the world is rebuilt? He had to know somebody in the government was going to try to take and corrupt that symbol. And yet his naive optimism once again got in the way. At a minimum, that motherfucker should have recorded something Tony Stark style and made sure that he delivered that to the world that like Captain America doesn't belong to the government. It belongs to the people. And right now, this shield, I'm handing this over. This is Sam Wilson, which is not to say that Sam needs some white dude to like bequeath upon him whatever symbolism he's got. But just as a practical matter, Steve Rogers shit the bed on this. He should have hemmed in the foes he knew would have been coming for for this decision at a minimum. Instead, he created a vacuum that Hydra types can fill. Yes. And that raises a good point I hadn't thought about, which is based on that wariness, he has to know that Captain America has meaning and value beyond him. That's why he hands the shield over. That's why he says, I want you to be Captain America. And... The fact that he basically just drops it off and he's like, I'm old. I don't really feel like talking to you about this. I'm real happy right now. And I'm just going to sit on this bench and watch the lake until I feel like leaving. (laughs) Also, that's got to be one of the most awkward, like walk away sequences of all time where they're like, so Steve, um, what have you been doing for the past 80 years? 
And he's just like, nah, not going to say anything. Don't yeah. feel like talking. I'm not going to tell you about the fact that I created multiple timelines and had to become a dimension hopping warrior who fought King the Conqueror. We'll just bury that and you can figure that out in Ant-Man 3. Yeah. Like, you know, ask ask him a few things. Like, did you try to do anything to stop Vietnam or 9-11 or... Or tell your fucking wife that Hydra is taking over the institution that she fucking founded. Right. Yeah. So many questions about what Steve has been up to. That's why I'm glad they're bringing him back because I feel like the second that they all, including Chris Evans, took a look at what that decision kind of did to his legacy, Mm -hmm. they thought we do need to address some of these questions, even if it's just in a couple scenes and a couple other movies with old Cap. Yeah, and I feel like it'll be, we'll have that, we'll have probably either Smart Hulk or someone else on the, like, who understands the whole time travel thing explain why he couldn't change things Mm -hmm. but i mean i'm assuming he might have in a different timeline and then because the only way it makes sense to me is that he went back in time he created a new timeline by doing so wherein he's with peggy peggy wasn't with the husband that she referenced in our timeline or their timeline i guess So that's a whole new branch wherein things might be very, very different. But then because he's created these timey wimey scenarios, he's he's off fighting that shit while Peggy's dealing with worldly problems and whatnot. And that's how he's able to then come back to this timeline, because it just doesn't track based on everything they said about how time travel works in Endgame that this Steve Rogers could have both gone back in time in our timeline and returned as the same person with nothing being different. It just doesn't make sense. I don't know. I'm confused. I don't really care if they ever make it make sense. To be clear, it's a comic book. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I still just blame Steve for not helping his friends and I appreciate that he needed to do something for himself to live some kind of a life. But again, one 60 second recording could help Sam out a lot. Maybe finding some way to keep in touch with Bucky or I don't know, just leave that dude a nice set of letters to read about the shit that he experienced over his time could have gone a long way to helping Bucky feel like somebody gives a crap about him. I don't know, man. Yeah. And I think you you hit on something that for people who've read comic books and who enjoy them, I'll accept whatever mechanics you give me. Like, I don't. Iron Man can't exist. Thor's hammer makes no sense. Whatever. I'll accept that those mechanics work. But give me characters that make sense and whose motivations and actions I can buy. Mm -hmm. And I'll buy into all the rest of it. It's when you have characters that do things that just seem completely out of whack that the more you think about them turn into these like massive world alteringly selfish events that you're like, why am I, why did I buy into that? Yeah. The idea that Tony Stark is now the selfless icon and Steve Rogers is the selfish dick bag is just not something I think Endgame wanted us to take away. Uh, But maybe they did. Maybe they did. I don't know. Yeah. That's where we're at. Jesse, I have the most important question of all for you. Where can people find and follow you? They can find and follow me on Twitter at Jesse L. Taylor, all one word. Okay, legendary listeners, that is our show for today. The Marvelous TV Club has a ton in store for you throughout the Winter Soldier series. Then it's Loki, then it's Ms. Marvel, uh, and more. And we might even have some fun with What If. So please subscribe, tell a friend, and leave a five-star Apple review. That rating makes a huge impact on our ability to be discovered, so we really, really appreciate it. Okay, Jesse, let's go get that shield back.